What up, fools? <coughs> this is the Joe Pedrosa Podcast, episode 27. Today I'm here with John. I don't know your last name. Ramlaw. <laughs> Ramlaw, yeah. I've Took all this time. <laughs> all so, right. yeah, we've been friends for uh, quite a while now. The way I met him was my older brother, your girlfriend, and, like, they were in, like, a library together. And yeah, then, they were, like, friends in college, and then... Yeah, but... That was a fuck ton of years ago. We yeah. tried to start a business yeah. one time, you know? I don't know if you want to talk about Our the legal business. Our yeah. le- all fully legal fully business. Fully legal. Nothing uh, sketchy about that. Do you want to talk about that or no? Yeah, yeah. Okay, why not? Yeah. yeah. So we uh, we were working for this company. Psyched Out. Yeah. Right. Called Psyched Out. And uh, we were microdose. We were selling microdosing pills, right? Yeah. Psilocybin, and it was like di- we had different stacks, right? We well, we attempted to have different stacks. Yeah. We had like what, um, just a regular hundred milligrams ginger, and then we varied that to different uh, degrees. But other than that, yeah. What, what? How far did we get with that before? Okay. Well, the thing was, yeah. I wanted to fucking get like a market. Yeah, you were a thousand dollars a month to pay some fucking guy yeah. you met on Craigslist Bro, to we do don't... marketing. For us. We don't know how to do it. not gonna work out. That was not We don't know how to do it. So yeah. we hire someone who knows how to yeah, do it. Yeah, some fucking it's guy on simple. Craigslist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He had a list of Redditors that he was gonna send our free merch to. Yeah, Could have been all his friends. Like <laughs> yeah. it was not gonna work out. That was too sketchy for me. Yeah, but unfortunately it didn't work out. But um yeah, essentially the what the company was, we were trying to sell microdosing. Mm-hmm. Uh we were talking about we were in that time we were like into the you know the psychedelic sphere. Yeah. Talking about like the beneficial aspects of microdosing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been microdosing for a couple of years now, and it's been like tremendously helpful for me. Mm-hmm. I actually wanted to ask you. So these were one of your uh, one of the things you wrote down as your ultimate truths. Right. Social or public truth legalization of psychedelics in the West could be detrimental to the psyche of the collective West. Yeah. So how would that be detrimental? You think? It's like a heavy question because. When everybody thinks about psychedelics, the first thing you think about is some type of interesting trip that you have, right? Yes. And then you get the experience out of it and everybody's like, oh, it's beneficial. But I don't think people have actually sat down and talked about the long-term aspect of a psychedelic trip, right? It is chemical mysticism. So basically, you're being thrown into a mystical experience that has no precursor to you whatsoever. You just take this drug and all of a sudden you're having some revelation about God or you're meeting demons. It can be something positive or negative depending on how you interpret it. But nonetheless, it's a mystical experience. And I think that the West isn't prepared for that because we don't have a mystical culture that is rooted in psychedelics. So you can go to the Amazon, you can find the Shipipo shamans and they're practicing ayahuasca, right? Uh, You go find peyote, South America, uh, even North America, you're finding the indigenous are using all different forms of cactus, right? Peyote, San Pedro, um, it, it varies, right? But over here in Western culture, we don't have anything. Yeah. So what happens is when people take these psychedelic experiences en masse, right? Let's just assume that it becomes legal and everybody's mm-hmm. taking mushrooms. Microdosing it, small doses, it's fine. There's therapeutic aspects. But if you're taking large doses and people in general who are new to this are just throwing themselves into the middle of a mystical experience, I think that's going to do more damage to the culture of the West because there's no discipline in it. There's no... What do we have in the West? We have Christianity, right? We have uh, Islam and we have, you know, other very sects of derivations of that, right? Judaism and things like this. But there's nothing rooted in that culture for the individual to have a mystical experience, whether that be through chemicals like uh, psychedelics or that's through something natural like prayer, right? Uh, I mean, they kind of reduce everything down to the ordination of God. So the moment that you have some type of mystical experience in the religion, it's God coming to you. But psychedelics brings that out of you. You kind of get the experience of God through something endogenous, right? Like, I mean, DMT is natural. If you take two hits of DMT, you find yourself in the middle of a mystical experience and you don't know what to do with yourself after. You become susceptible. And I know, I can foresee, I could be the the harbinger of doom for this, but when it becomes legal, you're going to find a lot of cults. You're going to find a lot of people. You think so? You're going to find a lot of people with cults with different ideas, and it's going to be popping out of nowhere. It's going to be underground, but you're going to be seeing people who say, 
I spoke to the seventh demon in the level nine hell, and he gave me the power to foresee all of your issues, and I can help you out, yeah. right? And then everybody who's taking these trips are going to be resonating on that same type of, I guess, awareness level, and they're going to be experiencing something similar, and they're going to believe in this guy, right? It's going to happen in pockets all over the place. We don't know what to do with ourselves after a mystical experience in the West, right? There's no discipline. Do you think, because psychedelics, <clears throat> like, an overall message that I learned from it's like everything's connected. Right. Like we're all one. Right. Do you think if we do that, there's like a mass, you know, uh, psychedelic legalization? Do you think it would create more division? Because then there's going to be these cults, and then versus right. like the people who don't take psychedelics right, at right, all. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I, I think it could be like the whole hippie movement all over again. But I think it's going to be different because people now are a lot more confident about it. And then you do get that that dissolution of ego where everybody is just like you know we're all one we're all love everything is happy and light and stuff yeah. like that and that's fine but to a degree because it's easy to take advantage of somebody when they're susceptible like that right and that's yeah. not even just saying an individual doing that if you had something like a global event that shifted people's perspective in a culture that is taking psychedelics with no background people will believe a lot of things that they shouldn't believe mm. because you're the dissolution of ego without any form of spiritual discipline is going to have a problem on you. So in the case of somebody who we could say is like, I don't know, let's just take a mystic, for example, somebody who doesn't do any psychedelics, but is um, devoted to the path of spiritual awareness and, and liberation, right? Um, and that's a problem in itself, but we'll talk about it another time, mm -hmm. right? If somebody's on that path and they take psychedelic, it's not going to do anything to them, right? They're going to have the trip and have the experience, but it's going to be another Tuesday for them. If you give that to the random guy who's working the nine to five and has like corporate issues, he hates his boss, his wife's mad at him. You give him this and he's happy, go lucky and everything in his life is so-called changed afterwards. His state of mind moving forward about mysticism and spirituality is going to be predicated on psychedelics. He's not going to be able to articulate what divinity and what something divine would be without referencing psychedelics. So it becomes a new form of God, right? And that's where the problem is. Because people are going to be looking at psychedelics as the medium to God. It becomes a segue to experiencing something divine. But that's the problem. Is that if you look around elsewhere in the world, you don't need a segue to find God or experience God. It's you, right? Or whatever ordination you believe in, whatever you want to assume that to be, it's fine. You, you can take that approach, but you're not using something to get there, right? The moment that you have a vehicle to get to God is when you're being robbed of it. It's like the spiritual liberation I was just saying, talk about later. It's you're being tricked, right? And you're tricking yourself by taking LSD every day or every other day and using that to get closer to something because there's no background. You have no discipline. So what, what do you think would be the best way to like connect with God? Because yeah. so, me personally, like my whole thing, like this might be a hot take, you know, <laughs> but, like yeah. religion for me is like, okay, so uh, I, I reference to the absurd. So the absurd is like our humans coherent meaning to uh, humans like kind of search for meaning and our inability to find it. Right. Right. And there's three ways out. There's suicide, mm -hmm. but that's an escape. There's right. religion which to me is like philosophical suicide because you're kind of like abandoning free thinking and just like going into this yeah, yeah, like blind yeah. ideology. Yeah. And this is coming from someone who like, uh, you know, I was like Catholic my whole life, but I'm just like, in my, my view on religion is like me going into like summer camp and shit and like, they're, they're like, they're like, they're like, like, we will rock you to like the Hail Mary. I'm like, what are we doing, bro? You know? Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're speaking yeah. in tongues and shit, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I, me personally, like I know, I listen to a lot of Jordan Peterson and he says like, you need God in your life. But yeah. for me, religion is like kind of like a cult. So what would be the best way to connect with God, like, if not psychedelics? Right, right. So I'll, I'll address religion first, right? Because okay. religion is basing your experience of God through somebody else, right? Whether that be a book or a person or a thing, you need that divinity through a copy of something. You need it through a medium, right? And that's where I said you're being robbed again. Because in general, you are everything that you'd be seeking if you were looking for God, right? And that's where I kind of go with you are God, right? It's... 
one of the ideas that I was working on for a while is that I was going to connect like Western ideology of Western theology to the Eastern theology, right? It's been done thousands of times. You don't need to listen to me. You can just listen to Alan Watts articulate, articulate it way better than I do. But the whole point of that is that if you are looking for God, you're being robbed. If any form of spiritual liberation of somebody trying to sell you on something, if you need to you know, wash away your sins to become baptized, if you need to do Hail Marys, if you need to meditate for eight hours a day and sunrise to sunset, like if there's some type of method for you to get to where God is, you're being robbed. It's not real, right? Somebody's come up with a plan for you to follow and then that plan is a part of their organized religion, right? It is yeah. a cult, right? Yeah. Um, the truth to finding and being a part of that divinity is to let go of all of it forget that it's like the rat race it's the nine to five but in a religion in religion right and that's what it is it's like you know people have these aspirations to become something great at work and to get a career but seeking god and finding it through jesus or muhammad or anybody is the exact same thing as a job you're just applying it in your spiritual life you need to just completely let go of that become an entrepreneur so to speak in your spiritual liberation mm, you can't right. yeah you can't uh, uh it's kind of it is like a hot take but anybody that's telling you that you need to become something to get somewhere is just a form of manipulation and i would say okay. that religion in general is just that cult manipulation so the closest way to get to god is, is to avoid religion is to avoid religion okay so yeah. and there's not a problem with it right yeah. i don't want to be that guy saying like you know if you're a good person because you're following it that's fine but the path to true liberation isn't going to come through that Right? If you're happy with the way that you are, and a lot of people don't look into this deep enough, they're not really earnest about it. The moment that you get some form of, um, you know, somebody touches somebody's head and they fall down, right? And then they're like, oh, the blood of Jesus is washing over you. Yeah. Your immediate reaction is something's going on here, and I want to know what it is. So you kind of get, you know, enveloped in that. And then you hear about all these things about if you become a child of God, you know, you can wash away your sins and like you're forgiven for your past. And it's, it's nice. It sounds good. But it's a sales trick. It's all a gimmick. Because if you ripped away religion, we took away anything that had to do with any form of religion, and we brought it back down to the spirituality or the mysticism that our ancient past has been following, across all cultures, across everywhere you go, you're finding the same form of principles of the devotion to self. Everything, is all is one, right? It, it, there's no difference between God, uh, this tree, the table, the bee, the bug, whatever it is, it's all one. And to treat something with a hierarchy is to rob yourself of the vision of God. So if you want to be closest to God, let go of form. Let go of all forms. Let go of what you believe in ideologies. Strip yourself away. Become like a child again. And it's not like these books don't have truth in them. Yeah. There's truth in them, but for those who can decode it. And I see that across all different religions, all different books. Like, for example, the, the most obvious one is to, like, uh, to become a child again. You see that everywhere. And that's true because the child is wholeheartedly in the present. The child is with no consequence. There's no repercussions in the child's action because he doesn't foresee that. He lives now. And I think it, that case is the closest that I could kind of spew it to you to become one with God is to just be right here and now because there's nothing else other than now. And God is that present moment with the dissolution of all other ego. Okay, but say I'm in the present. Right. Okay, me personally. Right. I was like thinking about this because I watched this Michaela Peterson clip of her discovering God. Like, you know, she, she has like a bunch of autoimmune disorders. She has yeah, a bunch of yeah. shit going on. And, like, she had this, uh, like, kind of, like, divine revelation, this, like, sign from God. Yeah. Do you think that needs to, that that sign needs to be there in order to experience God or know that it's there? Because for me personally, yeah. I'm very rooted in reality. Right. Like, when, sometimes when you, like, talk about me with your, your spiritual self, I'm just like, bro, what is this guy talking about? Like, this guy's, like, you know, yeah, fucking, yeah. You know like, the insidious yeah. universe. Like, I'm like, bro, I'm like, I can physically see yeah. I'm in a room right now, like, I can't comprehend something bigger. Yeah. Like, like I can be present. Like I could be right here, right now. You know, like we're filming a podcast. I'm checking. You know, this shit is if it's filming. But the thing is, is like, where does God come from? That you know yeah. what I mean? Just being here now. Like yeah. I, in my mind, I'm like it's this higher thing. It's like this. You know, well, this, you're like, being sold on that, right? So you don't think that's it, though? Well, okay. It's hard to put it in terms like that because, I, you know, there's so many different ways that I can say that you can 
experience God, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, being present is just another facet of it, but it's a bigger picture that sh- in which all of it connects together, right? So if we just assumed, um, let's take it from, you said you're like rooted in reality. So let's take yeah. it in a perspective that you can just very easily comprehend. There's not much else that you need to hear about mystical terms or anything, right? But the universe is all one thing, right? You can see it itself as a single organism, right? Mm-hmm. The whole universe, the, the galaxies, the stars, everything, right? It's all one thing it's all coming from inside itself out right humans plants stars whatever you want to just consider as an object it's happening yeah this whole single thing as one is the same concept as when i say that all is one like in a spiritual way right both in the physical and in the let's say mystical it's all the same thing it's all one it's all one substance and the moment that we start putting form and labels and ideologies on things is the more that we take a step away from that Right, you, you're rooted in reality, so you're gonna say that this is a microphone, and you're sitting at a table across yeah. from it. Right, you have to distinguish between what are things to make sense of it. But if you let go of that, if you stripped meaning from everything, it's not to say that you have to act like an idiot or you just become brain dead because nothing makes sense. It's that you're here, and everything that is a thing, so to speak, is God. And you're experiencing it by being here. That's when I say you're being present is that it is God. Everything is God. So if you strip away the ideologies that you know about things and the forms, you're left with it. And there's nothing else that you can do because it's all it. And you're playing a trick on yourself by telling yourself that, you know, there's a sign. God gave me a sign. Well, everything is God. So God gave itself a sign. You know what I mean? When like somebody says like, oh, you know, um, my husband divorced me and, uh, you know, the worst thing happened. My kid was in a car accident and uh, you, you wouldn't believe it. I looked up in the sky and I saw a cross, right? Mm. And it's like, you know, I think it was Jesus telling me. I didn't know about Jesus before. Somebody can say something about anything. God can give any form of sign. But what you're doing is looking for cues. Anybody who's look, who sees a sign is actually looking for a cue. And those signs are always there. But only when you're at a point where you're at your lowest is when you really notice them. So then you kind of navigate yourself towards what that sign can mean. So usually in a calamity, you find something that's beautiful, right? And it kind of keeps you going. That's that sign of God. But in reality, that sign is everywhere. But we just distinguish it in these mystical ways of somebody having some mystical experience of, you know, finding meaning. But the reality is, is that you're tricking yourself. And you were looking for that cue without you knowing. And when you found it, you ate it up. The reality is, is that everything is God. And there is no sign that you need to look for. It's all one thing. That's very interesting. Yeah, I need to like try and wrap my head around that. Yeah. That, I don't know, yeah, it's a very out there concept, you know? <laughs> what, one question I wanted to ask with all of that. Do you, so do you, like, you believe in God? That, that's a trick question. It's okay, like, you know, how's that a trick question? Because, like, what am I believing in? You know? It's like, if, yeah. If, if, again, like, if the principle is that all is one, right? I don't need to believe in God. It's that I am I am God. But you are too, and so is everything. So, in, and in some facet, you could say I believe in some concept of God, right? We can say that. But the word God is like that, it's like that uncomfortable word. Because... Every time you think of God, you have some form of image in your mind, right? I mean, for some people, it could be a guy in a beard and he's, you know, above yeah. the clouds, right? Other people, it could be the universe or for some people, it could be a statue. As long as you have that image, you are in some form or another just basing God down to its lowest form mm-hmm. because you need to comprehend it. But God is beyond comprehension. So if you say that, like, when you said, like, do I believe in God? Like, it's it's something that's beyond comprehension. So I just assume it to be, you know, as that word right now. But yeah, in some form or another. Okay. What, say, say if you like, okay, if you're like me, you're just like rooted in reality, you don't mm-hmm. really think about it, versus all is one, like what you're experiencing right now. What do you think the importance of experiencing all is one, like experiencing God? Yeah. And like any shape or form is compared to like being agnostic for example and just like not really focusing on it like what is the importance of god uh it's hard to sell something on that i feel like i'm gonna sell it to you you know it's like it's like a sales <laughs> trick all over yeah. again this guy's like, a salesman <laughs> by the way <laughs> yeah okay uh like what what like why why is it important you know yeah 
versus just living? I think it's not that it's important. I think the most important thing is to become aware of it, right? It's not like to believe in, it's not like the agnostic or the atheist and somebody with the awareness of what I'm talking about has some form of, you know, one-upmanship on the other person. It's like at that point, you're trying to sell it again. The reality is, is that if you become aware of the going on of what's happening, let's say behind the scenes of what's happening in your life, it takes away um, the anxiety that you have to worry about because you feel like life is happening to you and you need to go through life. So you constantly face these challenges and you're constantly, you know, up against life. You're battling it. And every moment in your life, you're going against the grain. You're not really moving with the flow of things. If you actually were able to realize that there is no path to follow, there is no grain to go against, there's nothing for you to face, it takes away that pressure from you. Because you have these expectations, and especially when religion's behind your back, saying you need to be authentic to go to heaven, you need to follow these rules, you need to listen to us, and if you don't, you're going to go to hell, it puts a pressure on you that you're not really aware of. So what I'm talking about is to take away that pressure. It's the unconscious pressure. It's the form of liberation that you don't know you need, but it's actually happening to you. So just letting go of that and becoming aware of what's happening is the truth to what's going on. And you don't need to overplay your role as Joseph if this is happening. You can just be Joseph as you are without the consequence of worrying about, you know, the unconscious happenings after death. Okay, there is this, uh, we've had this conversation or debate about um, life is suffering. Right. Like, my take is life is suffering. You right, know? It's like, right. we're going through the hardest fucking thing. Right. I'm, like, trying to survive as hard <laughs> as I can. But, like, the way that you're describing it is yeah. if we attach ourselves to God, then, like, then we're not suffering. It's, we're flow. We're in flow. You yeah, know, we're, we're going through it. Yeah, it's basically becoming it. Becoming one with God. You go through the flow. But would you make the argument if if you have my mindset of life is suffering yeah. you strive to become the best version of yourself do you think if you just live in flow you'll kind of conform to whatever like it is what it is it's gonna happen like i'm just gonna do what no it, what no happens, you no know? because that's taking a passive relationship right to what's going on you can still put yourself through all the trials and tribulations of suffering that you want because you can see what you get out of it but the person who is being put into the form of the state of suffering that you would be in with my mindset would be a lot more relieving because you know you're not going to die at the end of it you know there's you know your consequence of suffering brings something of a goodie right it brings something that you want right it makes you into a better person or whatever that is if that still is the goal with my form of life you could say you would still be able to attain that. You don't need to just take a passive relationship and let yourself flow along. You can still put yourself through suffering, but you're not the, I guess, the foot on your ass about who you're going to become isn't as important because you're going through the suffering. If I'm you and I'm putting myself through all this suffering because I want to become something, it sounds like there's the pressure of the role of you is important in some way because you're going to bring value. And there's just this underlying notion that life has more meaning than what you make it to be. So you need to live to that expectation, right? Like, if I was to be in your shoes and I knew that meditating eight hours a day was good for me, and it's that suffering. It's like I'm taking an aesthetic way to life. It's like, you know, fuck, uh, fuck hedonism. Yeah. I'm going to go the opposite direction <laughs> and just put myself through all the trials and tribulations I can, right? It's like, you know, as long as you know you're hurting, you're in the right path. It, it, that's what it sounds like to me, right? And you can still take that path, but you need to know that, well, I don't think you need to know, but I think you do get to know that it's okay if you don't put yourself into that character all the time. So what do you think would be the best character to go through? The one that takes, uh, the one that takes it seriously, but knows it's a game. That's the best so way to you, put it. Do you think life's a game? It should be treated like a game. Okay, so what's what's the rules of this game? Well, that's How the do thing. we navigate through that's this That's the thing, life? is that you can make the rules whatever way you want to. Okay. But if you think of life as a game, you know you're playing a character, right? So playing that character and putting yourself through the game gives you the relief to know that you don't have to be that character, right? 
you can stay being Joseph and put yourself to the life, the, the whole, you know, game of life and be Joseph as you are, yeah. but know that you don't, you're not stuck as Joseph. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, that there's another layer behind everything that's happening. So if you're playing the game and you never knew that you're playing the game, all that is there is you. And you never knew that this was a game. So you're taking this seriously and there's no fun because it's too serious. When you know that it's a game, you can have some fun with it because you know that the consequence of it all isn't important. You know what I mean? It's like if you're playing Monopoly, you can get as heated as you want in the middle of the game and towards the end. But when the game's over, the game's over, right? You can still have the, you know, the, the effects of the game can still take you on for a day or two, but that's it. The game's over. And I think if you don't know that you're playing Monopoly and you're in the middle of the game, everything becomes fucked up because you take it too seriously and things become stressful and it takes you down, right? So, okay. If, if we're calling, you know, the game of life. Right. Do you think, like, if taking a step back, am I, like, the avatar of the game? Like, am I the player? Technically. When you look at yourself, you're looking at your avatar. Okay. That's, what, that's the best way to put so it. So, what's past this game? Like, <laughs> what, is, what, what is beyond this? Well, that's the thing. That's, that's, that's the whole point of the game, is to figure it out. What's beyond? Yeah. You think... That's okay. the point of the game. That's what the point of the game is, to figure out what's going on. And when you ultimately do that, then, you've, then you're playing the game properly. And you can say you've won it, right? But that's what's happening. I, I, and this is where it goes back to, like, art. I know we've had a conversation about art and meaning and stuff, yeah. right? And I think that all art and all form of expression and creativity is just another expression of the divine. It's an expression of trying to figure out what that meaning is, trying to figure out what the game is. Because we're all playing the game, and some of us know and some of us don't. But we're all trying to bring out like the depths of meaning of what this game is, what this game of life is. And, yeah. Do you think that's everyone's like ultimate path, trying to find a sense of meaning in the world? Yeah, I yeah? think so. Have you found that, I, I, this was one of the questions, but have you found that within yourself? Meaning? Yeah. Like, where do you derive that from? I, it, it's, it's a little weird. Like, I have like a weird relationship with meaning because I don't know where I am, right? And I think if I was able to kind of reference myself to where I am, to where I'm going, to where I was, I can give you meaning. Because I can put it in, like, some timeline and say, like, okay, you know, everything that I went through from 0 to 13 made sense to my older self. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that I can try to derive meaning. And I'm not really good at it. I think that meaning isn't something that should be taken too seriously. You don't think so? No. I, I, I'm thinking about it more now. And I, I think if we get caught in meaning, you're getting caught again in some form of, like, purpose-driven outcome. Right. And, and at that point, like, again, I can say about the game, right. And not taking the game too seriously, but you're still supposed to have fun with the game. And the moment that you start putting too much meaning on things, I think you take that away. You take away the, the actual point of what the game is, is to play it. And having a meaning to win Monopoly could be fun and it's a part of the game. But if you're not enjoying the game to the point where you want to win, is it really worth it? You know what I mean? It's like becoming rich, right? So many people out here doing so many crazy things to become rich. Some things that you could say are like, you know, embarrassing or, or detrimental to their character, but they don't care because the whole point is to become rich. And after they get that money, after they get that meaning and they figure it out, what do you think they're going to be? I don't think it's going to be worth it. So from what I'm understanding, because you said with art like mm. it's trying to understand the meaning of the divine yeah it's like it's like an expression of it okay but the way like your personal meaning yeah it's the way i see it it's to have fun like to play the game and have fun you if, uh, yeah i can't look at it because i'm in the middle of it right so if okay. you were looking on the outside and you said it's to play the game and have fun i think if i was to, if i was to piggyback on that i think it'd be more figuring out what the game is by playing it Mm, right like just the game of life yeah like have you figured out any anything from the game so far i i, I don't know and that's like the mystery of it all right it's um for me like everything in life pans into itself like perfectly for me yeah yeah everything in life like pans itself in perfectly for me it, it's 
the whole my whole pursuit of mysticism and my whole understanding of what like life is the game and, and the whole process of playing it it to me is like one giant i don't know like play i look at it like a play because i'm the one that's the actor on stage and i'm going through the middle of everything and i feel like the audience is like the world around me and i'm this guy that's just going through this play and the more i become aware of my character and the role i'm playing in this play that's going on i start to become a little bit more hesitant like do i want to play this character and i'm breaking character at that point and i think that's what supposed to happen i think that's what my that's what my game is that's where my meaning is to completely break character and to go off script and to go somewhere where no one's ever gone before in my game right where would you want to go i don't know i don't even know i don't think this is where i think great great like mystical leaders and, and spiritual leaders have gotten that from yeah like you could say buddha jesus and muhammad whoever you want to consider in that category they broke script when you weren't supposed to and it's like, you know, if you looked at it again like a play, whose play am I playing? Like, wh what am I doing? Is this God's play? Am I going to break God's script and end up putting myself into some place where no one's ever been? Right? And that, it's kind of like a weird analogy to look at it. But the closest that I could say to meaning is to break script. And I don't think, I think people are actively trying to break script in this world that we're living in. But... I don't it's think, too scary to yeah i think it's easier to play the person that you're given right like it's yeah. easier to play joseph pedrosa right yeah because you have everything that you want set up and even if you know it or not but all of your ambitions they're your ambitions the things that you want to do nobody else is going to want to do them you're the perfect person to play joseph because yeah. nobody else can right like would you want to break character like w yeah i wouldn't be yeah. because it took me 22 23 years to like exactly. figure this character out so why would i try and break it though exactly and why would i <laughs> yeah well that well because you don't know what else you don't know what to be on that and breaking character isn't becoming a new person breaking character is stopping the play it's completely i guess like you're if if i had to put it up like your playing somebody uh i don't know in some type of game yeah. and you just stop playing right and you don't know what's beyond that what do you do after you stop playing if you break character and you stop pursuing the worldly possessions and views of joseph what do you do after that like what is there and i think that for me is a part of the game because like i i'm so devoted into being jonathan there's nothing else that i can be but if i was to stop being me and pursue some form of i guess liberation I don't know what would come out of that. Like, that's, like, to me, like, a monk. Yeah, the, the best way I could figure that out, it's either the fire movement. Like, right. you you make a bunch of money, and then you quit everything. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you're free to do what you want. Or become a monk. Or, like, live in the woods yeah. and, like, fucking... Right, right. Ag do agriculture and make your own food and shit. <laughs> right, like, right, right. that would be giving up everything. Because, like, the regular societal kind of, like, structure is get a 9 to 5, mm -hmm. get a wife get some kids yeah and then like retire in like 40 years unhappy you know what i mean yeah so I, I know you have a like a different perspective on like the whole nine to five and the whole like hustle culture like what what is your thoughts and perspective on that the whole nine to five and hustle culture yeah i don't know i i like you're against that yeah i really am i i it's necessary right like we live in a world where you somebody needs to clean the sewers and like you know someone's yeah. gotta fix your drain and pipe and stuff like that like it's it's necessary there's nothing wrong with it there's nothing wrong with being a part of it but for myself, I don't see value for me in being in that. And I think that might be because of what my personal pursuits are. So, like, again, like, I, like being somebody who's into mysticism and things like that. Uh, in cultures before, we lived in communities where people, like, who wanted to pursue things like me were taken care of. You didn't have to, mm -hmm. you know, do the nine to five. And then, and this goes for basically anybody in their craft. Like, you had the opportunity to focus on what you wanted to focus on do what you want to do and not have to worry about the burden of these, you know, bills and inflation and car insurance and, yeah. and things like that. Right. And I feel like that's robbing a lot of people of their true potential and who they really are. Right. So for me, the whole nine to five thing is it's another, it's like another game that you have to play and you can play it properly and maybe become an entrepreneur and become financially independent and stable and things like that, which to me is the most ideal way to do things. Right. But not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Because if everybody was, there, there wouldn't be people to do specific things that we need in society to do. So there has to be a balance. 
And I think like, you know, there's not going to be a person who's an entrepreneur working at Wendy's and say that their job is to be a cashier and they're their entrepreneur as a cashier. Like it doesn't work like that, right? Mm -hmm. You need that balance. So if you have meaning, in your case, if you have meaning or if you have purpose, follow that and make that into a passion, right? Just yeah. in general. Don't bother with the nine to five. If you can become profitable and happy another way. So wouldn't that be breaking the no, breaking the would, character? No, that wouldn't be. You that, don't think that's breaking no, the character, like the char becoming an entrepreneur? No, that would be breaking the character of society. Yeah. But that's not breaking but the, the overall character. No, no, no. Because, well, like just in general, if you pursue an entrepreneurship, you're still relying on other people to fund you by paying you for something, right? Whether that's a service or a product, right? Like you're, you're still very much enveloped here in this world. You know what I mean? So how would you fully break out then? Because we need money to survive. Yeah, well, well, that's another part of the character, right? So I think my idea of what like the character break that I'm talking about is beyond like uh, something that's very, I had to put like earthly. Okay. Like breaking character is more of like a spiritual liberation. Breaking character of meaning of all things, right? That in itself is completely different. Like, I think there's a lot of people out here who are just regular people working as like, I, I've met welders before who are so wise and so down to earth and so like liberated and all they've ever done was their job. And it's like, how do you become like that type of person? That always fascinated me. Like I yeah. found more interesting people in the workforce than I have at like ayahuasca retreats mm -hmm. or like meditation retreats and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I always find the most odd spectrum you find a lot of egotistical people in the place where ego doesn't belong and then you find a lot of liberated people where you usually would suspect to find a lot of people who are egotistical right yeah. and that fascinated me and i think whether we know it or not like as i said before i think we're all breaking character to a degree like we're not keeping ourselves grounded to this reality we know that there's more going on and i think that's where like wisdom and intuition and you know creativity come from it's like it bleeds into us that divine bleeds into us and we get these you know ideas and these visions of things and you know we paint from there we draw from there we write poetry from there it all comes from the same place which is the divine the yeah muse. like yeah basically the yeah. muse right like you can say it like that right yeah. like yeah so spiritual liberation if that's the goal like what does that look like uh within your own life or like how how what does that look like like right. i i know i can't say f like physically right 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 like? right like we're trying to break down the barriers right you know? right well <laughs> yeah like again like so i this is where i was talking about in the beginning is liberation is being sold on something so, like, if I was to tell you you can do something to become better, it, I'm selling you on something, right? Yeah. And I think that's what spiritual liberation is in our culture today in the West, and that's where it ties back into psychedelics, is that we're being told that, or maybe not being told, but unconsciously, spiritual liberation comes with an outcome. And that defeats the whole point of what spiritual liberation is. There is no outcome. It's just now. You ordinate yourself to being, I guess... Um, an amalgamation with the divine you become one with it so to speak and if somebody's telling you that you need to be liberated they're telling you that something is wrong right like you're not pure so you need to become liberated right it's like i know i've said this before to you the reason why you're not better uh the reason why you want to be better is the reason why you're not because you're trying to be sold on something and you think that if you get it everything's going to be fixed everything below from that point of where you've got it is going to be fixed so I think spiritual liberation, especially for myself, what it looks like is like unlearning as I'm going along, as I, as I progress, I'm unlearning a lot of things that I told myself and I taught myself what society taught me, what even religion has taught me, even though I'm not a part of one, it's just kind of unlearning it and amalgamating myself again, back to the one with it all. Hmm. I, I I wanted to ask you a question, because um, you kind of mentioned it. You're making sense of what you've learned in the past and finally integrating it into myself. Mm -hmm. Augmentation? <laughs> what, did yeah. you, what, okay. what did you write? Amalgamation, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. like that whole thing. It's like it's like you know incorporating it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah or yeah. rediscovery. So right, what, what is that like? What lesson did you learn in your past that you're trying to integrate today? Um, there's a lot of lessons. I. I I found, and what are you trying to unlearn as well? Yeah, I think, so what have I learned in the past that I'm trying to integrate today? 
I found it really weird. Um, I've been really into Young, right? I've, I've been into Young for a while. To what? Young, Carl Young. Oh, Carl Young. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I've been really into Young, and I've been getting into his archetypes a lot, right? Um, and one of the archetypes that uh, I've been really into is the uh, Puer Eternus. It's basically like eternal youth, right? Mm-hmm. And that is like the man-child in you, right? It's it's the, the youthful aspect that lives within yourself that doesn't want to let go of the youth. So you cling to it, right? Um, there's a lot that I can go into it, but I'm not really that knowledgeable about it. But one of the things I was going to draw into it was that I looked in because of the archetype, I was looking at myself and I was looking at my past and how I behaved and the person who I was, you know, you could say from this point on all the way back. And I seen that my character development is just a hundred percent rooted in the way that things happen to me. Right. So like, you know, you could say trauma, good, bad, whatever it may be, but I never really took notice to how I was as a person from how I was as a child. And I'm actually able to look at these two things as one and realize that like, you know, I'm very much that same like eight year old kid that loved sports world. And like, you know, the moment that I climbed the rock, the rock wall in sports world as a little kid, (laughs) it was like one of the greatest moments of my life. (laughs) Like I still look back on that as like a key core memory, right? Yeah. And like, it was a great moment. And I never really paid attention to who I was now And how that affected me. And as I become more self-aware of, like, you know, the person I am now, I'm realizing it's very much just my past. And, like, I'm integrating more about who I am now and who I was before. And I didn't think that was possible. I didn't even think that was, like, an option, right? Yeah. Um, Because it it just makes sense to me. Like, I want to give that little me love. I want to give that little kid that was, like, eight years old yeah. that never got his Olipop that one day that he really <laughs> wanted it. Like, love to give him a hug, right? Yeah. And it sounds like, to me, when I first thought about it, it sounded like a form of weakness. Because at first, I was like, well, that made you better, right? Didn't you learn from that? Like, oh, you know, just because you didn't get what you wanted didn't mean that the world was going to end. And I was always looking at my past in a very, like, harsh tone, like, you know everything that you went through is the reason why you are the way you are now and like you love yourself now right yeah okay well then it's good but it was such like an abusive relationship and when i looked back with more love and care i was like oh shit like you know you didn't get that lollipop like come here for a hug instead of scolding myself and i'm realizing that for so much of my life i was scolding myself i was always giving myself shit for not being the way that i wanted to be and it was like a toxic relationship so as I look back, I, like I said, it's like rediscovery. It's like I'm rediscovering myself for the first time and looking at myself in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. And it's it's reflecting on me now, presently. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's like what I'm going through right now, but in the present, you know, I'm like yeah. <laughs> beating myself up. Like, <laughs> oh, you need to fucking work harder and shit. Yeah, yeah. But uh, going back to your childhood, how how would you kind of... That this whole idea of like connecting with your inner child was is fascinating to me because I, I do believe a lot of your passions and all, a lot of your interests come from like what you were passionate passionate yeah. about as a kid as a kid yeah, yeah um but you're kind of looking at it in the way of like kind of healing that inner child yeah right how would you how would you like practically do that like how would you we, you know I actually did this meditation yeah. a, a while back but. Like I said, I'm very rooted in reality. It didn't work for me. <laughs> okay. The meditation was in Calgary. Did it I was one like, time? Like, yeah, it <laughs> yeah. doesn't work, guys. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this shit ain't working, boy. Yeah. It, I was like laying down, yeah. right? The meditation was like in a forest, right? I was laying down on a yoga mat. And this girl, she had, I don't know if you know about this either. It's like upper earth, middle earth, and lower earth, mm. right? So we, she was saying middle earth is like the worldly things. And she was like, we're going to bring you to lower earth. So what she did was like, I want you to close your eyes, blah, blah, blah. Guided meditation, right. walk down a set of stairs or slide right, down. Right. And then after you get, you're in the core of the earth and then you're on like this beach, there's water. And then you see your inner child and your inner child is saying something to you. And then you see your future self and then your future self is saying something to you. And you're like kind of talking to your, yeah. your child and your future self. And like, I guess that's like the closest practically practical way I went through it. But when I was going through it, I'm like making up what they're saying in my head. So I'm like, is it me okay. or is it like the yeah, yeah. like the inner yeah. child, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So like what 
Uh, what are your thoughts on that okay. first? And I'd then love second, to talk about that. Yeah. How, what were okay. your thoughts on so, that? So this is, again, bringing it back to Young, right? Yeah. Active imagination. He talks about this. He says that if you... Ha- okay, so these archetypes live within us. They live in the collective unconscious of all humans, right? And one of the things that Jung noticed is that across all cultures, these archetypes existed. So, like, just a little brief background. He, people would be like, oh, how did... Um, the archetype of the Senex, the old wise man, exist in the African culture at the same time as it did in, you know, Eurasia, right? Like, I mean, people would draw these things, but Carl said, no, 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 it's all a part of the collective unconscious, right? And active ab- imagination is tapping into that, co- like, you know, unconscious state that lives within you and bringing forth these archetypes. So if somebody takes you through guided meditation. What they're trying to do is to connect you to. Carl would say an archetype, right? Somebody else would say your inner spirit or God. There's a million names for it, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole point is to bring you down somewhere where not many people go often, right? And in Carl Jung's case, he has like books on this where he's taken people down into a form of, you could say, guided meditation or a theta brainwave-like state, right? Very, really low. And uh, these people have conversations with like, you know, the archetype can form in all different ways. He gave me an example about this woman who never had an artistic outlet. Uh, her husband was very controlling over her, and the only chance she had to be artistic was to paint her house. And she, like, you know, was in turmoil for so long about how she was going to do this. Is she going to paint her house, uh, you know, a color, like, green, blue? She didn't know what she was going to do. And uh, she sat there one time, and she kind of got into this, like, you know, alpha brainwave, you know, state where she was really low, like how that woman was trying to bring you into guided meditation. And she spoke to this Japanese figure who was uh, androgynous, and it was representing her artistic output. And she had conversations with it. So when somebody's trying to bring you down to that state, they're trying to do the same thing. When this woman had conversations with this Japanese artist, it was basically just herself. It was an archetype of herself, but she was actually able to speak to it. And I believe the artist inside of her was like, um, you know, I cry for you, like I weep for you. You don't do anything that's artistic. Yeah. And the only chance that you get, you're squandering it, right? And she had, there was this conversation that went along and she got liberated from it. She's actually able to unconsciously speak and be aware of what was going on. So when somebody tries to bring you down into meditation and speak to your, your child and your future self, um, it's the same concept. They're trying to get you in that subconscious, unconscious state where you can actually communicate with yourself. And it's possible. This isn't like it some is hearsay. Okay. Yeah, it isn't some hearsay where it's mystical and stuff. I mean, uh, a psychologist could do this with you, right? Like somebody who might be more Jungian than other people, but uh, they could take you down and bring you into a state where you're able to talk to archetypes of yourself. Okay. So how did you connect with your child like? Your child self. Well, I've tried, I, I think, like, successfully, I've tried taking myself in states like that. Like, if oh, I yeah? go to meditate, um, and I, anybody can do this, but if you hold that image of what you're trying to look for long enough in your mind, a story will take place on its own. In your case, you said that you might have been talking for them, right? And this is where, I guess, comes in the practice of meditation and, and focus and self-awareness, but... Anybody can do it. It's not something that's hidden just for the mystics, right? Or, or for somebody who's a meditator. But yeah, in my case, I would meditate or I would sit there and even before bed in like a really calm state and I would envision my youthful self and like what I would say to them in circumstances that had happened in the past, right? So if something was traumatizing to me, I would have put myself now as the current me, the present me in like a third point of view where I'm looking at my youthful self after this incident happened and I would just wait and then eventually it takes like a life on their own it's not like I'm hallucinating or anything like that but I'm kind of self-conscious I'm self-aware of what's happening and the emotions that's going on and then I'd just be like like you know like you, you deserve a hug or like you know something needs to change between what's happening now and what happened in my past and like it's not your fault and it's just about I guess speaking to yourself it doesn't have to be like all spooky and mystical or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it could just be practical. In your case, if you want to connect with yourself, you just have to get to the state where you're actually emotional about something and talk yourself through it. And even if you're not seeing anything, I don't think you're, you, sh- you have to every time, but if you're not seeing anything behind your eyelids, when your eyes are closed or you're not hearing anything. It's not the point of it. The whole point of it is that emotional release or at least like some form of connection. Mm, okay. That's interesting. Um, I'll definitely try and do that. <laughs> Instead of yeah, but I hope you didn't think. pay for that thing. 
I mean, yeah. my friend paid for it. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> we have 10 minutes left on the podcast. I wanted to talk to you about uh, you, the other truth you said. Right. You could spend, uh, yeah, we're going to spend the last 10 minutes talking about this. The mind is all. I am the mind. I am all. Right. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the mind is all? Uh, like, you kind of touched on it. Like, I can, I can understand it. Yeah. How everything is one. But the mind is all like it's similar, but it's also different. Yeah. At the same time, I I think the mind is like the the segue I use for what I can call it all. But the easiest way to put it is, I mean, we all if you subscribe to the idea of the mind, right? It doesn't work for some people who are very material, who says there is no mind and it's just the brain and chemicals. But if you subscribe to the idea that everything is the mind you and I are all both using our minds to experience everything that's happening. And so is everybody else. And if you have some form of schizophrenia, for example, in which your reality is completely different than mine, the immediate reaction is to say that there's something wrong with you, right? Uh, Something, a chemical imbalance or something like that. But in your reality, in your mind, in your world, things are happening different than how it is for everybody else, right? Supposedly, because we don't really know how our minds are for individuals, right? Yeah. Um, but when I say that everything is the mind, that's the premise behind that part is that everything in this universe is done through the mind. In my case, it is because my mind is how I perceive everything, right? My senses are part of that, but beyond my senses exist in my mind, right? And the next part of it all where I say that, you know, um, I am my mind and like, you know, all is one, it comes back down to that first part, but what I think I'll do is I'll touch on something different. I don't know if you ever heard about this guy, Neville Goddard. No. No. So he was kind of like a... People call him like a modern-day mystic uh, back in like the uh, 20th century. But essentially what he talked about was that you can dictate your reality, right? You can literally what people would call manifesting, right? You can manifest your reality the way that you are. So if you have a self-concept about yourself, if you were a specific person you're only going to ever get what that person would get right and i'm going to break that down a little bit because i don't think i really put that too well but in your mind you create reality so everything that you ever got in life is um what you basically deserved it's it's what you created for yourself so if you want a better life you first have to become that person and then everything else will follow you don't have to achieve something to get to where you need to be when you become what you want to be first you will get what you want so the idea is that you manifest in every moment of your life right and i'm just going to use the word manifesting because it's the easiest way to get it across right yeah. but you're manifesting at every moment of your life right now the past the future everything you're doing is a product of your own mind it's a product of how you think it's a product of how you act how you perceive things and if you want to change that if you want to become a better live a better life so to speak and let's say become financially free right you first have to become the person who's financially free and when i say that i don't mean that you go get a car and like you know you have all the money that stuff comes after you first have to mentally be that and if you ever look around at some of the most successful people and i've noticed this like i've been like heavily into becoming aware of this but everybody even like mike tyson has this beautiful line where he says it like you become first what you are and you get everything else after that right Hmm, successful people like they build their mindset mindset is everything and you talked about like you know going through suffering and how that shapes you into the person who you want to become so to speak right that is another form of it because you know that if you go through this form of suffering you're going to get something out of it that changes your character and that change can't go back you're going to get the value of that change and everything that you reap from that change is going to come to you and the idea is that you can you can eliminate that process of suffering by just becoming that person in a way it's like breaking script slightly you just become the person don't bother assuming that you need to go through all these trials and tribulations to get the wisdom that you need to be the person who you want to be just be that person and everything that that person in your mind um wants will come to you if you become it so in another way like when i tie it back down to the mind it kind of just shows that reality isn't fixed you're not being pushed along by reality reality isn't just kind of throwing things at you you are your reality and you control the things that happen to you and it 
it's very weird, but you take a form of responsibility for things that happen to you, even though they're outside of your volition, right? Like, if I, I can't really give a good example off the top of my head, but if something were to happen to me, I don't bother reacting to it. I don't bother going like, oh, fuck, this is terrible and whatever, right? Like somebody cuts me off or like I get a dent in my car or I don't know what, like, you know, problems come to me from work or something. It's my doing. I'm all of it. And that's where I say I'm all like I am the mind. I'm all with one is that everything is me. So if something quote unquote terrible is happening to me, it's my doing. And it takes away the edge of fighting with it. Again, like battling with what's happening. I'm kind of more experiencing it. And I'm experiencing it like objectively. There's no subjective input of me like assuming that this thing is going to destroy me and this isn't good for me or this is amazing and I'm so happy. It's just more of I'm experiencing the situation that's happening and I know that it's my doing and I'm, I'm taking responsibility for it, both good and bad. Hmm, interesting. You got me in the first half. Yeah, I probably got half, you. The second <laughs> half, I was kind of, right. like, kind of like when you're talking about when something happens to you, that that is your own doing. Yeah. Like, how is that? Because like, the first half when you create your own reality, I, right. I can understand that. Right, right. You know, like, kind of like manifestation. Right. Right, like. But how, like, this is the thing. Like, you have to be manifesting everything. You can't manifest one thing and not another thing, right? It's like when people say that everything happens for a reason, right? Or like, oh, that was meant to be. If somebody ever was like, oh, that was meant to be, I was meant to meet you. Or like, oh, that car accident in which I won that lottery the next day after I bought my car accident, it was meant to be. Every moment in your life has to be determined if you're going to assume that one moment in your life is determined. You can't just have free will 99% of the time and then 1% of the time there's something deterministic that's going to happen to you. The same thing applies with manifesting, right? You can't be manifesting one thing and like, oh, I finally got it. I got like the brand new car I wanted, right? No, everything is manifested. So you are responsible for everything that happens to you because it's all you. Right. Okay, but wouldn't you make the argument? It's kind of like, like it's kind of like a zigzag, right? If one of it is free will and the other one's like determinism, yeah, right. So for example, I'm going to become a filmmaker, and right. then the next day I get hit by a car, and then I'm like, oh, maybe, not, maybe I don't want to be a filmmaker. Or okay, let's say okay, race yeah. car driver. Right, right, okay, right, right. I want to be a race car driver. Right. I'm manifesting. I'm going to become a race car driver. I'm practicing and shit. Right. And then after determinism i get hit by a car i'm like nah fuck that i don't know but it doesn't work like that because everything is determined right and if you're manifesting you're you have to be accountable for everything in the past so your thoughts create reality that's the dictation behind it right if you're manifesting what are you manifesting from it's your thoughts right and you are thinking from a place of wealth wealth will come right and if you imagine wealth and you perceive these these uh, extraordinary imaginal activities in which wealth comes to you it can come through through that way but what you're doing is you're feeling wealth you're becoming wealth you're becoming a person who's wealthy in your mind and that wealth will follow you but you don't know what you've thought about in the past i can't tell you what i thought about this morning i don't remember yeah but if i'm in a place where like i'm always uh in something that's like negative or something shitty right I'm going to be always getting that. And I think we can, like, you probably have examples in your life, but I do of mine, of some people who are always fucking negative and they're always getting that same shit to them. It's like the universe just throwing shit at them left, right, and center. Yeah. But it's their own doing, right? Even the events that happen outside of their volition is still their own doing. So you first have to become what you want, right? So if you want to become a filmmaker, or let's go to the guy who's a race car driver, yeah. right? He wants to become a race car driver. And this is something that, how long has he thought about it? Let's just say a few years, right? Yeah. He wants to become a race car driver, but he gets hit by a car and says, I don't want to do it no more, right? His accident to get hit by a car was probably something that he was attracting to him, right? That he became. He became somebody who was attracting an accident. For what reason? I don't know. And that's where it becomes complex. If you look at your own life as what you're manifesting and what has happened to you and everything that you've been through and look at it at the, lo the lens that it's your responsibility and you caused this, for me, it made a lot of sense because I can look back at the person who I was and what happened to me and be like, it fucking makes sense. Like, how could I have not realized this, right? And if you don't even want to look at yourself, look at like a, a celebrity or somebody who's influential, right? It could be an author or it could be like a filmmaker or... You know, like Mike Tyson's like a good example, right? The mindset of that individual dictates who they are, 
And in that case, if that's really what it is, then change your mindset and become who you want to become. And there's that word for it. Like I remember, like I wrote this word down like dozens of times. It's just praxis. Praxis is just becoming the mental state of what you want to, who you want to be. It's adopting those principles. Yeah. Do you have any final things you want to say? I don't know. Um, I don't know. What is the best way to live? You best say? way to live. Uh, any advice for people who are trying to understand the concept of the mind is all? Well, I'll go with best way to live. Best way to live is right now. Not, nothing else. Anybody else is selling you in the future, in the past, don't bother. Present. Uh, and anything that I could tell people... Trying about, to understand the concept or trying to integrate that concept of the mind is all. Uh... I would say, just just don't bother trying. Tom <laughs> don't, <Mikowski>, don't try. <laughs> yeah, don't try. <laughs> trying is going to be the reason why you wouldn't be successful with it. But yeah, I, I don't really know what I would say to anybody. It's very personal as a practice. So if yeah. somebody does get involved into it, it seems like they'd probably find their own path. I wouldn't want to sell anybody on a path to take to it. Yeah. Yeah. Because if they're trying to sell you. <laughs> exactly. 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 Cool. All right. Thanks for watching. Uh, the Joe Pajosa Podcast, Stay on Average Fools.